This week on the show, we cover FreeBSD on Cavium's Thunder X. We look at NetBSD as an OpenBSD user. We also take timestamp notes in Vim, as well as OpenBSD 6.5 being tagged. FreeBSD and NetBSD are also in Google Summer of Code 2019. And we look at SecBSD, a Unix-like operating system for hackers. And other things in this week's episode of BSD Now. BSD Now, episode 290, Timestamp Notes, recorded for the 20th of March, 2019. Hello, I'm your host, Benedict Kreuschling. And I'm Alan Jude. And a new week for BSD Now, uh, bringing you the latest headlines. In this week, we have Armed and Dangerous, FreeBSD on Cavium Thunder X, ARCH64. Yep. Uh, so, uh, Eerie Links goes on to say, while I don't remember for how many years I've been interested in CPU architectures that could be an alternative to AMD64, I know pretty well when I started uh, proposing to test 64-bit ARM at work. It was close after the disaster named Spectre slash Meltdown that first uh, dug out the server class ARM hardware and asked whether we should get one such server to run some tests with. Uh, I think most of the ARM stuff was not vulnerable to Meltdown, but was vulnerable to some of the variants of Spectre. Mm, um, so they say, while the answer wasn't a clear no, it also wasn't exactly yes. I tried again a few times over the course of 2018, and each time I presented some more points why I thought it might be a good time to test this. But still, it wasn't able to get a positive answer. But finally, in January 2019, I got a definitive answer, and it was, yes, go ahead. The fact that Amazon had just presented their Graviton ARM processor may have helped the decision. So, how do we go about getting your hands on an ARM64 server? Uh, eventually, they got a Gigabyte R120-T32, and it was ordered and arrived at our data center in February. It wasn't perfect timing at all, since there were quite a few important projects running concurrently, uh, which drew away resources that we could have applied to this. But still, we put together a draft of an evaluation sheet uh, with quite a few things to test. There was a lot of yes slash no things, and some required performance measurements. We set aside a few hours to put uh, some drives into the machine, put it in the rack, configure up the EFI and the BMC, and we quickly found that there was no firmware update or anything available, uh, so we should uh, be good to go. However, the IPMI console, which required Java, was not working at all. Mm. A few colleagues have different uh, Linux dishes running on their workstations, tried accessing it, but no luck. It looks like uh, a problem with two new Java versions or something. I didn't yep. even try to do it on uh, BSD workstations because I've never got even the super micro one to work there. Uh, but they say our common installation procedure uh, for special servers involves a little device that stores uh, CD or DVD images and presents a virtual drive uh, over USB. Since ARM64 machines usually don't have optical drives anymore, there are no CD images available for those architectures. Fortunately, it's not that complicated to prepare a USB thumb drive instead. Um, once we... Uh, once that was done and they was able to confirm that remote administration using serial over LAN worked, then they did that. And then being the company BSD guy, um, it was pretty obvious that testing FreeBSD on this machine uh, would be my natural task. Uh, FreeBSD on ARM64 is currently a Tier 2 platform. How it has been planned for several years for it to become Tier 1. Uh, and they said even better, the Cavium Thunder X was selected as the reference platform for ARM64 and a partnership established between Cavium and the FreeBSD Foundation. Uh, and so they talk about getting FreeBSD up and running. Uh, yep. And playing with all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of more in there. Mm -hmm. Like some of the... Uh, stumbling stones in there, but uh, they got pretty far. And I guess with 12, it's even better, I think. Yes, uh, the ARM support stuff in 12 is much better than the other one. Mm. Uh. Yeah, so they write in their conclusion, uh, Tier 1, 
Obviously, we're not quite there yet. Booting off of ZFS does not work. There are no binary updates. Even with 12 stable, uh, they've been unable to get the Nix working. And you wouldn't want to run a server with 4x10 gigabyte a gigabit and 140 gigabit Nix using just one gigabit USB to Ethernet adapter. Uh, nope. <laughs> On the plus side, however, FreeBSD generally works and seems stable with UFS. Building from source uh, using 49 threads work and so does building software from ports. Uh, they even installed Synth and ran the build everything for over a day, but some serious load on the machine without any problems. I think there's been work on the network drivers. I guess um, it being a gigabyte machine rather than a ThunderX, maybe it's slightly different. Mm. Yeah, so um, they write that they'll f- post a follow-up if there's more developments, and if anybody has more information on making it work, please let them know. Yes. Um, I know that well, with EFI, it shouldn't be too hard to get ZFS booting working on ARM. I might have to... I don't have time for that, though. Uh, mm. Maybe we can give uh, Tumas uh, an ARM64 machine and he can fix the booting. <laughs> <laughs> Here, go wild. <laughs> yeah. I have the same problem with that they're speaking of with the IPMI with some of the older nodes in the cluster. So they don't accept... Um, Java versions low, uh, higher than eight, so I have to. Um, I have an old Windows machine with Windows uh, Java seven on it, and that mm-hmm. makes the IPMI work. But if I go to uh, Java eight, it doesn't work anymore. I had one old IPKVM device for machines that didn't actually have a built-in BMC, um, but it was very old, um, which meant that you had to edit some Java config file buried in your system somewhere to allow it to talk RSA with only 512-bit certificates, which is just Ooh. never made any sense to have only 512-bit certificates, but they did. And then as newer Java came out, they upped the minimum to, I think, higher than 1024, uh, meaning that these 512-bit certificates uh, were just right out. Uh, but some config hackery uh, to allow it to talk. But yes, it is uh, the problem with a lot of this software. You know, with the newer Supermicro stuff, it has an HTML5 console, which is nice. Yes. Except for our main use of this is the remote media feature to install the OS. And <laughs> yeah. obviously, that only works in Java. Oh, really? Yes. Hmm. Uh, HTML5 one lets you control the console and do everything except for remote media. Ah, the ones on the newer Dells that we have after we, f- we flashed them with the newer firmware, which also now does Redshift, but I haven't used it yet. That can do the HTML5 GUI, the console, and also the remote media mounting. Um, How does the media mounting work? So you get an, uh, a little mount. So you, so you get a, bo- a box with your screen or mm-hmm. your terminal window, and up there there's a couple of buttons like Control-Alt-Delete and other stuff, and there's one that opens another window for mounting the media. So you can browse it and then attach mm-hmm. it to the device. Are you uh, sure that's it's, not using Java? No, it's not ju- using Java. I have completely deinstalled Java on that. Hmm. And I can use it from my Mac, which also doesn't have Java. I've, I've not seen how you could actually make that work with HTML5. Uh, like, yeah. I think the other option that uh, Supermicro has is you can give it a Samba path. Mm-hmm. And it can mount like a Windows share to get access to the ISO. Yeah, but, but we're using Dell's, not Supermicro. So, but next time we meet, I can show it to you. Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, speaking of looking, uh, uh, or next time we meet, here we have an article about someone who's looking a little bit more left and right. Uh, what other operating systems out there, specifically looking at NetBSD from an OpenBSD user perspective? So that starts with uh, I used to use Open uh, Net or NetBSD quite a lot from 2.0 to 6.99. But for some reasons, I stopped using it about 2012 in favor of OpenBSD. Reading on the new 8 release, I wanted to see if all the things I don't like on NetBSD were gone. (laughs) Here's a personal pros and cons list. No troll, hopefully, just trying to be objective. So, uh, grabbed 8.0, AMD64, ISO file, and fired a new VirtualBox instance up. So first, the pros, what I liked. You can choose the lock option from install. This is the journaling option for a fast file system on NetBSD. Uh, on OpenBSD, it is called soft dep. And as far as he knows, it's not available from the installation wizard. One has to edit the FS tab to add the option. 
One can install binary packages from the install process. In fact, he could install package in, PKG in the package manager, but failed installing third-party software, but didn't try uh, very hard. So PKG in is really intuitive. Uh, is now used to package underscore add dash Q something to search for OpenBSD binary packages. But running PKG in search is far more intuitive from the newcomer perspective. Here the one that didn't read the man page yet. <laughs> okay, the cons are a bit uh, more. Uh, so things he didn't like is it seems you can't tell the installer to use all the remaining disk space when partitioning the disk. You have to set the default value to zero, then look at the remaining space, and then use that value for the last partition. Mm -hmm. On OpenBSD, the wizard automatically detects that size and offered it, offers it by default. Uh, installing from HTTP is something he'd rather do. Uh, in his test case, he could choose that NetBSD installation method, but the network card could not be configured. You can do it from the extra steps of the wizard. On OpenBSD, configuring the network is one of the first standard steps. Uh, on FreeBSD, it's a bit weird. It's normally a step at the end, but if the image you're booting off of doesn't have the install files, then that step moves up earlier, uh, and then you do the install over HTTP or FTP. Yeah, maybe a little bit of a rearranging is in order. Uh, yeah, then uh, talks a bit about... Um, problems with the keyboard because he has a French keyboard and configured that during the installation and it was populated to the NetBSD installation. In console it was using FR but by default XDM still uses the US keyboard layout. Uh, so hence he had to kill XDM, run the x-configure, edit xorconf and restart XDM. On OpenBSD Zeno DM the, for the Zeno Cara uh, automatically inherits from the console keyboard layout so that's nice. Um, yeah, on NetBSD, there doesn't seem to be any sudo or do as binary by default. You have to switch to root using su, and don't like that much. Yeah, if you're used to that from OpenBSD, but, yeah. then... sudo is third-party software, so... Not part of the base yeah. system. Yeah. Okay, then he went for complete then, X. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, once you get into packages, that's uh, pretty special, <laughs> or <laughs> less specific to the OS. So on. Yeah. But, is... And then they have a conclusion. Mm -hmm. So that was it. I didn't spend more than 30 minutes of it, but I didn't want to spend more time on it. I did stop using NetBSD because of the need to compile each and every package. It was in the early days of PKGN. I also didn't like the way system maintenance was to be done. OpenBSD's six-month release seems to be far more easy to manage. I still think NetBSD is a great operating system, but I believe you have to spend more time uh, on it than you would have to do with OpenBSD. That said, I'll keep using my Puffy OS. So, time for the news roundup this week, uh, covering using Vim to take timestamped notes. Yep. That sounds uh, interesting. So this is an interesting one. Uh, the uh, poster goes on to say, I frequently find myself needing to take timestamped notes. Specifically, I'll be on a call, in a meeting, or an interview, and I need to take notes to show how long it's been since the meeting started. Basically, I want something that looks like this. And they have a screenshot, and it shows, you know, the first note was taken three seconds into the meeting, and the second note was taken 26 seconds into the meeting, and then another one, you know, another note at one minute and 12 seconds, etc. Mm -hmm. My first thought was that there uh, would be a plugin to add timestamps, but a quick search didn't turn anything up. However, a little digging did turn up the fact that Vim has this ability built in. Um, or, well, has the ability to tell time built in. Uh, this means that writing a bit of Vim script to insert a timestamp is pretty easy. After a bit of fiddling, I came up with something that serves my needs, and I decided it might be useful enough for other people that it was worth sharing. So here's what they came up with. So they set the timestamp enabled and timestamp start to zero. Then when you toggle them, it turns on. And then when you call the timestamp function, it gets the second, the minute, and the hour, and prints those out uh, and sets up uh, the timestamp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Yeah, they say this is made slightly more complicated uh, that it needs to be by my desire for a relative timestamp. So it's minutes into the meeting rather than the actual time on the clock. Uh, obviously, uh, if you yeah. just want the time on the clock, it's actually quite a bit easier. And they have an example of a much shorter script. 
Mm, sure. Um, especially if you're doing a call where there's uh, a recording or something, having the relative time is quite useful. Oh, yes. Yeah. Notes can uh, be very I thought about packaging this up as a plugin, but decided it is a bit too simple. But feel free to copy this code into your own VimRC. Uh, like all the other code, it's MIT licensed. Mm -hmm. And closes with, so VimScript will probably never win any beauty contests and will definitely never be any, uh, his favorite language, uh, but it can be pretty handy for wiping together quick utilities. That's quite useful. I was actually when I read this story, the first thing I thought about is um, John Baldwin, one of the main FreeBSD developers, has uh, been experimenting with keeping meeting notes in GitHub. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now, uh, in his meetings repo, there's a Beehive directory with a markdown file for each of the Beehive teleconference calls, with the notes from the meeting, the list of who attended, and then notes of what people were talking about. Um, and I think the idea is that they will do the same thing for the, the transport call, which deals with TCP IP and so on. I think currently they're doing about the same thing, but doing it in a wiki, but uh, yep. putting it in the in this repo will be uh, nicer. Um, and I think the new iflib call will start using it and so on. Uh, so it'll be nice to have a centralized location where people can go to find the the notes from all the meetings that we're having. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in case you missed those or want to see what's been discussed or what probably is mm -hmm. coming down the line. Um, speaking of what's coming down the line, OpenBSD 6.5 beta has been tagged, although by the time we record this, this might already be out. But nevertheless, uh, it's a greeting from the Time Flies department. Uh, they say that it's at uh, that time of the year again, Theodorat has just tagged 6.5 beta. Uh, a good reminder for us all to uh, run an extra test install and see if your favorite port still works as you expect. And here's the tag and the log message. Yeah. Um, again, by the time you watch this, is probably already um, more out or even uh, release available. So uh, we'll I cover that. The release is yet. It's uh, like two months away, the, I think, or something. Uh, yeah. But that's oh, that's for they ports, want people then. to test it. Mm. Yeah, uh, provide testing because then they can fix the bugs before they appear in the release, and no one wants that. Okay, speaking of BSDs, we have also a uh, message from the NetBSD Foundation because they're uh, participating in Google Summer of Code 2019. So they got accepted as an uh, organization. Yep, it says, uh, for the fourth year in a row and the 13th time in total, uh, the NetBSD Foundation will participate in Google Summer of Code. If you are a student and would like to learn more about Google Summer of Code, and I provide a link to the page there, you can find a list of project ideas uh, on their NetBSD wiki, and do not hesitate to get in touch uh, on the NetBSD-Code IRC channel uh, if you are interested in talking to someone about this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, FreeBSD also got accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, also in uh, like the seventh consecutive or even more. I think so. Yeah, we might have been consecutive the whole time. I don't know that we've ever taken a year off Google Summer. Uh, mm -hmm. Not in so, recent yeah, memory, anyway. Mm -hmm. These are good um, ways for students to get involved with open source projects and get paid for it when they complete their projects, and also mm -hmm. um, for the projects who give students a little bit of a, an isolated project that they can work on and improve the operating system in various ways. Yes, the uh, BECTL tool that's now part of FreeBSD in 12 uh, started as a GSOC project uh, by yes. Kyle Knettinger and was finished uh, by Kyle Evans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had a hand in that uh, as mentor. Yep. And so, yeah, it's also important that uh, enough mentors are available in these projects to uh, help the students uh, with a bit of a, a getting started or in case it's getting yes. more technical. Uh, you know, for for a lot of the people that have, um, you know, gone to school com for computer science or something, haven't necessarily actually worked on an open source operating system before. And it can be uh, a much different environment and just a much bigger thing than, uh, you know, working on little programming assignments you've got at school, right? Yeah, so yeah. Like, this is like, more. Well, here, here's a bit of code, but it has to integrate with this entire operating system, which is this giant repo with history going back 25 years. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good luck, by the way. <laughs> Um, speaking of BSDs, uh, our next item is about SecBSD, a Unix Lite OS for hackers. So this is over at discoverbsd.com, and they write that SecBSD is, as I said, a Unix-like operating system focused on computer security based on OpenBSD. Designed for security testing, hacking, and vulnerability assessment, it uses full disk encryption and Proton VPN plus OpenVPN by default. And a security BSD environment for security researchers, pen, pen testers, bug hunters, and cybersecurity experts. Uh, developed by Dark Intelligence team for private use and will be public release coming soon. And they list a couple so of tools. Looks like it's, that, yeah, a bunch of uh, default tools and cool, including OpenVPN and ProtonVPN, Nmap, Metasploit, uh, Burp Suite, uh, Social Engineering Toolkit. <laughs> Go Buster, Aquatone, GitRob, uh, Recognizer, the uh, OWASP, um, Waff Woof, uh, <laughs> Names. <laughs> Red Tide, yeah, and lots of different uh, pen testing tools. Mm -hmm. Even uh, SSH Punk. Yeah, as well as SQL Map and Aircrack, of course. And, so. um, some other all the tools could be quite a handy little uh, live CD or or you know, laptop OS for doing pen testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be interesting to see it as a uh, special purpose BSD for uh, security vulnerability testing or penetration testing. Yeah. yeah, and if they have a release up, then we'll cover it in a future episode. Time for Beastie Bits this week. We have why OpenBSD rocks, and it's just the same URL. Uh, so why-openbsd.rocks, uh, they list a couple of facts. Some of them, yeah. Yep, like 64-bit time T, uh, open source code repositories, which used to not be common, uh, anti-ROP, audio recording, full disk encryption, uh, LibreSSL, CARP, all that kind of stuff. Oh. Mm-hmm. Big list. As, yeah, uh, also specific utilities there. So I guess these are the ones that the author likes the most mm -hmm. in that. So yeah. Uh, next up, we have Rich's POSIX shell tricks, uh, including doing things like printing the value of a variable using printf. Um, you know, it's in adding the new line. Um, and it talks about why using echo isn't necessarily. Uh, a valid substitute for that. And they say, uh, never use echo like that in particular. According to POSIX, echo has unspecified behavior if any of its arguments contain an escape uh, or if the first argument is dash n or anything like that. And they have a little table showing how different commands you might uh, try to run are not going to necessarily give you the same output. And mm -hmm. That's why they were using printf there. Uh, reading input line by line, showing how they would do that. Oh yeah, they have a lot of uh, different things. Uh, reading input byte at a time. Byte by byte, yeah. Yep. Uh, using find with xargs. Um, what I would recommend they do differently in that one is oh yeah okay. ah yes I see they are talking about using the print zero option uh, deal with path names but they're using some said stuff which is interesting uh, returning strings from, fine with from the shell functions command. yep oh yeah there's a bunch of things that are not in your typical shell or that you more probably don't know mm -hmm. right away getting non-clobbered output from command substitution, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. oh. this, Returning uh, a string this. from a shell function, shell quoting an arbitrary string. They have uh, quite the said line for that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, working with arrays in POSIX shell. So unlike enhanced born shells like Bash, the POSIX shell does not have an array type. However, with a bit of inefficiency, you can get array-like semantics 
in a pinch using uh, some pure POSIX shell. The trick is that you have one and only one array, the positional arguments, like $1, $1, $2, uh, and you can swap the things in and out of the array uh, using the set command. Okay, that's some useful string, utilities. They have things like how to tell if a string matches a glob pattern uh, using fn match, uh, counting the how many times a letter shows up, uh, lots of different things. So lots of cool tricks in there if you uh, are looking how to do stuff in shell. Mm -hmm. And just in case you need a little bit of break, why don't you do a little bit of coffee drinking with Ock? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely so yeah, this something... Is a, uh, a program for keeping track of what your office mates owe uh, for the coffee they drink with a simple Ock program. <laughs> so this is, uh, the following is based on a true story, although some of the names and details have been changed to protect the guilty. A long time ago, in a place far away, there was an office. The office did not, for various reasons, buy instant coffee. Some workers in that office got together and uh, decided to institute the coffee corner. A member of the coffee corner would buy some instant coffee, and the other members would pay them back. It came to pass that some people drank more coffee than others, so the level of a half member was added. A half member was allowed a limited number of coffees per week and would pay half of what the members paid. Uh, managing this was a huge pain. I had just read the Unix programming environment uh, and wanted to practice my awk programming, so I volunteered to create a system. So step one, I kept a database of members and their debt to the coffee corner. I did it in an awk friendly format where the fields were separated by a colon. So they'd have member, colon, person's name, colon, their member status, so one or half, colon, and then uh, the last number. So the first field uh, above identified what kind of row it was, in this case a member. The second field is their name, uh, and so on. The last field is their debt to the coffee corner. A positive number means they owe money, a negative number means the coffee corner owes them money. Then step two, I kept a log of inputs to and outputs from the coffee corner. So there's payments, from Jane of $33, or a payment from uh, Pratyush for $17, and then uh, John bought $60 worth of coffee. Uh, and so they paid John back $50 of that, meaning that they would still own John $10. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, I was ready to write some code. The code would process the members and payments and spit out an updated members file with the new debt levels. Uh, the shebang line work, uh, required some work to get right. Uh, I even used the env command to allow passing multiple arguments from the shebang, uh, specifically the dash f command line argument to tell awk that the field separator was a colon instead of, I think, a tab is the default. And then yep. their little awk program dealing with adding and subtracting and different types. And then at the end of the program, it loops over all the members and prints out the new lines. Uh, along with a script that iterates over uh, members and sends a reminder email to people to pay their dues, uh, the system manages the coffee corner for quite a while. <laughs> yeah, that's the little office program that you always wanted to have and you just needed to write it yourself. <laughs> yep. Just hook it up to PayPal with instant payment notifications. <laughs> Excellent, yeah. So it you automatically credits people when they pay. <laughs> or hook it up to Stripe and just bill people's credit cards. ka -ching. <laughs> Okay, here's also something you would like. Uh, civilizational HTTP error codes. So what's that, you think? Well, it's easy. Uh, to be truly useful, HTTP error codes need to take into account possible future issues. We therefore propose the 8xx range of codes for errors pertaining to the civilization in which the server is operating. And here we go. Alan, it you start. apparently inspired by an RFC for the 7xx series. Mm -hmm. So 8.0, 80x, uh, temporary failures, but I'd wait a while before re requesting. So 801. Blackout. Yeah. 800. So we have a blackout nuclear winter, Gulf stream error, 
Uh, data center underwater. <laughs> Error 805, politicians. <laughs> 806, rejection of science. Does that sound familiar? Uh, internet not available. Or 807, stone tablet, carrier not supported. 808, drum machine no longer available. Or 809, Eight. Skynet, you answer my request now. <laughs> Uh, 81X, unused, so 811 is rapture, as well as 812, second coming. Uh, and the 820 series is very permanent failures, including uh, humanity deprecated, chimps taking over, uh, Venus syndrome, Maxipox zero, uh, vacuum collapse, or zombie apocalypse. Yes, error 826, <laughs> zombie apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Just be followed by 83x, success. Uh, 831, singularity, server ascended during request. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the 840s, you get 841, all your DNS are belong to us. And 842, uh, Metallica not found. <laughs> and the last one is 861, uh, Yellowstone Caldera for geology. It's, yeah, the geological events have prevented the server from answering your request. <laughs> yeah just in case you need them you know already what kind of error codes you uh, will get yep uh, so next we have the roadmap for midnight bsd uh, a lot of people have been curious of what their plans are over for this year so i've had a lot of uh, bug reports lately first the plan is to release 1.1 in the next few weeks this is mostly a security update uh, with a new version of several popular software packages it will be a small update from 1.0. As a result of this work, uh, plans for the package manager changes have been pushed off to 1.2, along with the related uh, installer work. In terms of ports, we plan on working into the uh, flavors feature from FreeBSD. Uh, some of the plumbing has already been put into the package manager to support this. However, it will take a bit more work as there are modifications needed to our package cluster software to be able to handle it. Uh, the package cluster software is getting rewritten currently. Uh, at the time of the 1.0 release, there were a lot of outdated packages. We've since fixed several and updated many GNOME-related ports. All the Qt5 updates are still on the to-do list, though. It is also determined that there are problems with Python ports, as more things are transitioned to using Python 3. This requires the flavors work to be, uh, so that you can get Python 3 versions of ports. Mm -hmm. On the browser front, Epiphany and Midori were updated last month, along with some of the WebKit ports. The Firefox port is partially done, but stalled on badly needed compiler updates. Um, work has started on porting LLVM properly, but uh, complications arose upstream. Uh, we didn't get a hard no, but a soft no, along with needs for a build cluster node for their project. Uh, so to keep things working on different distros, uh, the LLVM project likes them to donate a, a build bot. Uh, they say proper LLVM slash Clang ports are needed as a starting point to get Rust and other languages working more easily. And this is the top blocker for really solving long-term browser support. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seems like uh, a lot of work for 2019. Mm -hmm. And then we have a post uh, of Hello World from a NetBSD. This is a NetBSD running on a Nintendo 5. 54, which I think is a switch. Ah, oh, interesting. Actually, I'm supposed to say 64. That's a typo. Ah, okay. So Nintendo 64, yeah. Ah, and sorry. That might be an old console, the Nintendo 64. Yes, it must be because it's only 93 megahertz. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. It's using uh, an NEC VR4300 CPU. Mm hmm. Uh, it has a 16 megabyte max page size. And after that, there's not much left because yeah, Hello it, it's World, not actually, no root. It's not actually booting the operating system. It's just booting the kernel. Mm -hmm. But I guess someone is uh, having uh, too much time on their hands and maybe getting that to really boot to multi-user. And last but not least, we have from Vimperator to Tridactyl. This is um, uh, about BIM, of course. Uh, earlier this month, I experienced a life-changing event, or so I thought it would be. It was fully anticipated, and I had been dreading the day for almost a year, wondering what I was going to do. 
so what was this event? On September 5th, Mozilla officially and fully ended support for XUL extensions, XUL, uh, XML, the user interface language, aka legacy extensions. Uh, and with the last uh, Firefox release to support this extension was Firefox 52 uh, Enhanced Service or Extended Service Release, the browser he had been using for some time. And so Firefox 6.0 ESR entered Debian Stretch to replace that. And that matters to him because there are some key bindings Wimper way to gave him that he was afraid of losing a browser configuration from a text file also edit any text input using a real text editor, as well as mouseless browsing, custom key bindings for everything, and uh, some other uh, extensions like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uBlock yeah. Origin. Sometimes when filling out a ticket or something on a website, being able to hit a key combination and have it pop up an editor, write it, save it, and go back into the box in the browser would be really handy. Mm hmm. Yeah, and then he talks about special tridactyl customizations in the tridactyl uh, RC. Uh, they are a bit different than the vimperator.rc or vimperator mm -hmm. RC, um, but, but he provides a couple of examples. Uh, even better at mouseless browsing. Oh, good. So yeah, check out the full uh, blog post for the details. I also talk about other extensions I use, like uBlock Origin, uh, U Matrix and Grease Monkey. Uh, yep. Okay, very nice. Question time. Yeah, question oh, time. Question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, from Russell, the first one, a uh, big one. BSD Now question, ZFS and FreeNAS. Uh, starts with, howdy, Alan and Benedict. Just a heads up, transparency. This is a question that I've asked in FreeNAS, but I want to ask the experts. I hear from every week too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, plus, this has more details, is better worded, he hopes. So he's going to be resetting up a long-standing FreeNAS server and wants to redo the pool that sits on it. Originally set it up with four 2-terabyte drives and two 3-terabyte drives, originally encrypted the volume more than uh, as a thought experiment, then not, uh, and now definitely does not have anything that needs encryption on it, nor does it want to have the maintenance headache. So mostly it's a software install backup, Plex media files, time machine backups, which are inherently encrypted, etc. And the new drives will be bought over the next several months and be 8 terabyte NAS drives, some plan uh, 6 total. Now, for the questions. Uh, he's not totally interested in more than two redundant disks. Given the material he plans to host there, that's plenty for him. Currently I use a RAID Z2. Should I go with what's uh, going forward or should a striped pair of RAID Z1s be better? Uh, I think the RAID Z2 would be better uh, because if you do two separate RAID Z1s, um, if you get the two disks that fail happen to be in the same RAID Z1, then you'll lose your data, whereas with the RAID Z2, you will not. Um, technically, you might get a few more IOPS out of the two RAID Z1s, but with only six disks, uh, that probably doesn't make sense. And it sounds like your workload is mostly going to be contiguous reads anyway, and so you'll get more performance out of the RAID Z2. Yeah. Okay, second question. Does it make sense to use different compression algorithms for different data sets? I know I'm going to have some plain cold storage files. For instance, time machine backups sent to that server are ideally never touched and certainly not uh, often. Would gzip 7 work well there? What about Plex Media? I noticed for the Plex Media files that I've got virtually no savings using the default LZ4 algorithm. Yeah, so... For archive files, you could use gzip. Uh, it's really slow, though. Um, hopefully, before the end of the year, we'll have Z standard integrated, which uh, will give you the compression levels you get from gzip, but with speeds that are hopefully 10x faster, um, which would make a difference. Um, so if it is really cold stuff, maybe gzip 7 will save you some space, uh, like you might get 2.5 instead of 2.0 to 1 compression or something. Um, so you could do that. Um, for the media files, compression is not very helpful. Uh, the files are already compressed with lossy compression, so there's no lossless compression that's going to help you there. Uh, in general, I just set LZ on LZ4 for everything, and then there might be certain data sets, in your case, the cold storage stuff, where you might decide to use gzip7 or something to get more compression. Um, 
hopefully in the future, you'll have uh, a slightly better options with said standard uh, and be able to get gzip 7 like compression, um, but without the terrible, terrible performance. Mm. Uh, third question. If I want to encrypt a single data set later, can I? When we have that feature, yes. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> not today, but by later, yes. Um, I think one of the last bugs with the encryption feature was uh, they found the fix for it yesterday. I don't think the fix is actually committed to the repo yet, uh, but they found the problem with uh, replication uh, with encrypted data sets uh, in ZFS on Linux yesterday. Oh, that was the showstopper? Or uh, one, one of the... <clears throat> it was the showstopper for them releasing uh, ZFS on Linux 0 0.8. Ah. Uh, uh, there's still some other ones. They're working on getting the trim feature integrated and a couple other things still. Okay. Uh, so anyway, um, so in the future you'll be able to encrypt a single data set. Although, in general, what you will do is you can create a new data set with encryption, and then copy the files over to it. Uh, you can't encrypt in place per se. Yeah. Same. But yes, compression. in the future you will be able to have a single data set that is encrypted with, or, or even two different data sets that are each encrypted with different keys, uh, which is useful. Mm -hmm. Which is quite a bit different than what Geli does, which is. Uh, whole disk encryption. Okay. And so the fourth question is, my current pool is around 81% full. I know there's some stuff I can toss, lots of backups of computers that just need cleaned out, lots of time machine backups and all. But I want to keep most of the files but not necessarily the current data sets. What's a good migration strategy for this? Keep in mind I do have both the old Jails data set from Freenas 9 days, which houses his Plex, and the newer IOCage stuff, which handles other Jails. So he provides a migration strategy... Uh, for a small server that only has six data ports and base. Uh, so for your first, you're uh, with one only drive. six drive connectors, it gets a little more complicated. But Yeah, so 11 steps to do that. So first, remove one drive from the existing pool, going to the graded mode. First drive that gets here, set up a temp ZFS pool and default data set. Copy and paste all the unstructured data across from it from command line. ZFS send and receive the two different jails data sets next. Pull the new drive and plug back in the old drive. Uh, destroy then the existing pool, set up the new one as wanted. Then pull a drive from the new pool going into the graded mode. Uh, plug back in the new drive and copy back the data into the new structure. Oh, here. Then destroy the ZFS pool on the new drive and replace it with the existing new pool. And uh, then let the pool resilver. And for each new drive, replace one of the smallest drives allowed to resilver. That's... Basically, what I did when I did mine, except for I had enough data that I needed two of the new drives to do it, so it was a bit more complicated. But I had the extra SATA ports to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that plan mostly works. You'll have to be very careful to actually do what you wrote and not accidentally do something different. Um, for the unstructured data and so on, uh, our sync is very nice uh, for mostly, unless you do something like CP does, but is resumable. Um, other big thing is try to, in, when you're making this new pool, create data sets, lots and lots of data sets. Try to keep each data set less than some reasonable amount of size, uh, like maybe 500 gigs or two terabytes. It depends on the amount of stuff in your pool. But if you mm -hmm. keep each data set to a reasonable size, if you have to do something like this again in the future, you'll have reasonable sized chunks you can move around. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So his last question was about automatically growing. Um, when you put in a bigger drive, sometimes it'll grow, sometimes it won't. If you need to force it, you just do zpool online-e for expand and the disk, and it will notice the extra space and make it available. It is not the default to auto-grow because you might not be doing that on purpose. Hmm. And yeah, he thanks us for. Uh, our, and also, uh, mostly, you won't, uh, if it's all one RAID Z2, you won't get the new space until the smallest drive goes up in size. So if you have a mix yes. of twos and threes, once you replace all the twos with eights, the size per disk will go up to three for each disk. And then once you replace the last of the threes, then the size will go up to eight per disk. Mm, can be expensive. But, uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, you have the redundancy there. So yeah, thanks for your uh, feedback about the show and uh, that you like it very much. Seems like you're in a good way of uh, running ZFS with FreeBSD uh, for a long time. 
I'd be if, happy with it. If your plan is to keep growing discs small over time like that, you might consider doing three sets of mirrors. So three pairs of discs. Um, the advantage with this, obviously, with the new pool doing it this way, is uh, as soon as two discs in one pair get the new size, you get the extra space. Mm -hmm. uh, it does provide a bit less protection against a concurrent failure, two drives failing. But uh, it also means that in the future, again, you just replace the two smallest drives and you get more space right away, allowing you to get more space over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are the considerations uh, with RAID-Z. Okay, uh, let's go to someone else called Alan with one L. Uh, tutorial in-store ARM BSD with no other BSD box, please. Uh, that's a bit shorter. Goes like this. Hi, guys. My project, ham radio repeater controllers using Raspberry Pi clones. Do you have a tutorial on loading BSD onto, say, the Banana Pi using only the computers I have, all Linux boxes, ARM and AMD64? Uh, and in general, you would just write the image for the Banana Pi to the SD card and then put it in the Banana Pi and boot it. I don't know that much about the Banana Pi specifically. Yeah, but it's just uh, an embedded board with uh, that takes a SD card that you can flash with DD or yep. with a GUI tool even. Um, uh, and uh, not using the serial console, just the network port or perhaps an HDMI monitor and USB keyboard and mouse. Yeah, so um, once you put the BSD image onto the SD card, uh, it would boot up and you get the login prompt. So that's where you use the USB keyboard mouse, configure the network uh, and enable SSH, and then you'd be able to SSH in from then on. Yeah, so that way you don't have any problems with Linux not being able to mount the BSD file system because by then it's just networking and that yeah. understands the file system. Yeah, so that's typically yeah. uh, what you do. None of that requires uh, a BSD box. You know, um, I often write USB sticks for that kind of thing from Windows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and then you flash that, and the flashing makes it uh, create the file system on the um, flashed media. But yeah, if you have that project finished, that would be interesting to, to hear. Um, maybe you have a blog post about that uh, later on, so we can cover this in a future episode. This would be interesting to the ham radio people out there. Um, last but not least is Johnny this time uh, with a new section to add to the show. Uh, he writes, Hi Alan and Benedict, I would, uh, it would be nice to add a discussion section where the two of you would discuss a subject or some topic that is trending in the BSD world. Instead of just reading the news, actually discuss one of the topics and give us your opinions. Just something that may uh, add another dynamic to the show. Why would anybody care about my opinion? <laughs> <laughs> uh, or our opinion. Sometimes we're at the same opinion. Sometimes we, yeah. or oh, seldomly we are not. But. <clears throat> yeah, it can also depend on the subject. Uh, many subjects I, you know, don't have an expert opinion in. Uh, we just read the news. You build yeah, your own uh, opinion. It, it, it really depends on what the news in the week is, whether uh, there's something I feel strongly about. But I don't know. If people had a specific topic, I suppose we could try. Yeah. That's what IRC chat rooms are for, or other ways of like pop in the topic and then let people discuss it to the <laughs> to the very end. <laughs> but yeah, um, it could be something that people are interested in. I'm not sure if it would be a section that it will be in the in the show because it kind of keeps growing as the show uh, keeps on getting these discussions. Um, but I guess um, discussing uh, things in the BSD world is something that you can do at conferences or. Um, chat rooms um, or chat uh, channels that are about the BSDs. Yep. Uh, but yeah, thanks anyway for asking. And uh, again, if you have anything about uh, uh, the BSD world that you want to have us cover or um, a question for us, whether it's about BSDs or anything that uh, is interesting to you that we want to that you can help you with maybe then send all these to feedback at bsdnow.tv and then we'll have something more for our feedback and questions section that pretty much wraps up our episode this week thank you for watching and see you next time yep. bye